Thank you, Pastor. It's always a pleasure and it's always a privilege to be on this side of the pulpit. Um, you get a completely different view of what's going on. You can actually see people responding and see whether they're doing something or like Brother Roy sleeping in the back or something. We, we just don't know, right? So it's really, uh, it's really interesting to be on this side. But no, I consider it always a pleasure and a privilege to be on this side of the pulpit. And uh, my prayer is that uh, what gets said tonight is a blessing to everyone. All right. Um, if you would open your Bibles with me tonight to the book of 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And if you wouldn't mind standing with me, we can read a couple of verses here tonight. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we'll look at verses 23 and 24. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me just pause there and say, I am so glad that Christ is coming. Amen. I am so glad. It could be within my lifetime that we be in the presence of our Lord. We just don't know. And I'm just so thankful that Christ is coming soon. Verse 24, it's our jumping off verse for tonight. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this time, Lord. We thank you so much for the privilege that it is, Lord, to, to be able to gather together in this way and to spend a few minutes in your word, Lord. I just pray that tonight would be a night where we, we look internally, Lord. We look at ourselves. We look at our lives. We look at our spirits, our attitudes, everything about us, Lord. Do an inventory and, and see if there are things that we can, we can change, Lord, things that we can mold, things that we can throw away, Lord, so that we can get closer to you. Help us understand, Lord, what it means for, for us to not only be faithful to you, but to understand, Lord, that you've always been faithful to us, Lord. We thank you so much once again for this time together. Bless the service. Thank you so much, Lord, for just continuing to, to take care of us throughout this, uh, this situation that we find ourselves in, Lord, and we just thank you so much once again. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You know, as humans, as Christians, we know and we understand that, that disruptions are a part of life, right? Sometimes those disruptions are really small. You know, when, uh, when an appointment is missed or, or when a schedule has to be changed um, because of some unforeseen circumstances. We, we know and we experience that all the time. Uh, my wife and I planned to go on vacation in April. Well, you know, that didn't work out really nice. But we understand that disruptions happen. And then sometimes there are disruptions that are life changers. Sometimes there are disruptions that change not just how we live our lives, but they change everything about it, our schedules, our thoughts, our attitudes. Sometimes even our families, our friends, our relationships, everything in our life changes. In 1986, I was 10 years old. Go ahead and do the math if you like. It was January of 1986. I was 10 years old in elementary school, and I'm gathered together with all of my students in my classroom, and we're watching a television, and we're so excited. We're 10 years old, and in 1986, every other boy, every other girl wanted to be an astronaut. And so here we are, we're sitting in front of this television, and we're ready to watch the first teacher launch into space. Krista McAuliffe. We were all excited to see the first teacher who could have been any other teacher that we would have known at that time. And we were excited to see her. And if you know the rest of the story and the tragedy that unfolded after that, we know and we understand that disruptions are real. Fast forward to 1989. Maybe some of you were here during the Loma Prieta earthquake, right? I was sitting on a sofa, actually I was laying on a sofa, getting ready to watch the Oakland A's and the uh, San Francisco Giants go at it in the World Series. And the earth starts to shake. So violently that I was thrown off the sofa. But that wasn't the scary part. The scary part was what happened afterwards. When the shaking that subsided, you can hear homes exploding. What was going on? Well, the gas lines of these homes were rupturing. Disruptions are part of our lives. We could even fast forward to 9-11. As we're sitting there, we're watching the television, 
completely glued to the events that are happening, feeling powerless that we can't do anything about it. Changed lives, just like that. And now, with everything that we've seen this year, with the COVID situation, a life-altering event that's been going on for many of us since, what, February, March? That's, we're talking a whole year now, right? We don't have an end in sight. We don't necessarily know or understand what's going to happen next. Everyone in this country, everyone in the world, has somehow been affected by what's going on today. Whether it's the youngest of the elementary school to the oldest of the oldest folks, everyone has been affected and disrupted by this current situation. And I understand that even as this disruption goes on in life, it's easy for us to become restless. It's easy for us to become frustrated. It's easy for us to start pointing fingers. It's easy for us to be upset. But let me tell you this. My God is a God of peace. And the same peace that was available to each and every one of us before this pandemic started is exactly the same peace that is available to us today. And sometimes, somehow, for some reason, we've forgotten. You see, the Lord our God is faithful. He's always been faithful. Remember those times in your life where you thought that maybe God wasn't as faithful as you thought? Right? And that's the problem. We're doing too much thinking. Right? You may be looking at current events right now and saying, you know, maybe God isn't as faithful as I thought he was. Maybe I thought God would have, would have manipulated the situation in such and such way where we come out ahead. Right? And that's the problem. We're doing too much thinking. You see, there is no way for us to be able to understand God's perfect plan for us. We can try to figure it out, but without God, it's impossible. And everything that God has for us has been there from the very beginning. Nothing surprises God. And I know that sounds simple, and I know most of us have been Christians for a long time, and, and, and we hear it all the time, and, and we kind of get it. But we don't. We don't understand sometimes that nothing surprises God. And that what is happening right now is exactly the way God knew it would happen and continues to know what will happen later. There's no way we're going to be able to understand through human reasoning or logic or any of these things that things were meant only for God to know and understand. You see, I can promise you this. If God's word says, faithful is he that calleth you, then you better believe that God really means that he is faithful. And it's a faith that goes both ways, as we'll see tonight. It's not just by sight, but by faith. So then what do we do? What do we do to respond to these life-altering disruptions? Is there a course we should take? Are there things we need to do? do? Do I say a certain thing? Do I go to a certain place? What is it that we do to respond to these life-altering disruptions? What do we do to respond to the burdens that come with these trials, that come with these disruptions in our lives today? And we're all going through them. We can try to deny it as much as we want, but we know and understand that these disruptions are affecting each and every one of us. Well, the answer is, the Word of God has plenty to say about it. There are some steps that we can take to truly experience God's working in our life, to see His faithfulness. And if there's one thing I want you to get tonight, it's to know and understand that God is faithful to us. And if there's something wrong in that relationship, it's not God. It's us. Right? So what are these steps? What is it that we do to see God's faithfulness, to truly understand and live and, and be, able to, be able to experience the faithfulness of God in our lives, even during these circumstances. What we're going to see here tonight is so simple, you can probably memorize it all in your head. But I gave you some notes just in case, all right? Number one, we just need to trust in the Lord. 
Number one, trust in the Lord. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Do you know how hard it is for us to not lean into our own understanding? Do you know how difficult that is? My natural tendency is to lean into my own understanding. In our current COVID situation, if you're honest, we've all turned into experts. You notice that? We are now all expert doctors. We are all expert uh, psychologists. We're expert uh, politicians. We're expert economists, domestic and foreign. We are expert theologians. I mean, we are experts in everything today. How do we all become experts all of a sudden? Where were we as experts before all of this happened? Right? I guess we were doing things probably that were a little more important. Right? And if we would only just listen to you or to me, we wouldn't be in the situation that we're in, right? I mean, after all, if you all just listen to what I'm saying, I have the answers, right? That's what we see in today, in this day and age. With so many different experts, we just, it's amazing to see where we've come. We've forgotten what it means to trust the Lord. None of this, the current world situation, its length, how it began, and how it will end is catching God by surprise. So the question comes back to us, do we believe that? And if we do, then why don't we trust him? We say we do, so then why isn't it manifested in our lives if the first thing that we do is go back to our own reasoning? Well, the answer, as you've probably figured out, is quite simple. It's our sinful nature, right? It's our sinful nature. It's our arrogance. It's our pride. It's everything about us that says, I know exactly what to do because I am wise enough and perfectly equipped with the knowledge to make the decisions for myself and my family. That's what we say in our lives. But we've forgotten our almighty God. We've forgotten the creator of the universe. We've forgotten the sustainer of life. We've forgotten a God that is so loving that he invites us to cast our cares upon him. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, a familiar verse for probably all of us, casting all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward if you think about it. How much of our care should we cast upon the Lord? Well, it sounds like we need to cast them all, including the situation that we find ourselves in today, right? Casting all our cares upon him, for he careth for you. Reading verses like this just changes the way I view God sometimes. Because I look at my life and I say, Lord, I am failing you in so many different ways because I'm trying to, I'm trying to handle all of this all on my own. And I'm trying to, to logically conclude these conclusions that, that just make sense. And, 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 and according to logic, if I just go to this direction, it, it, it would go in this way and all of these different things. And I've completely forgotten to put my trust in the Lord. I've completely forgotten that the Lord is the one that I need to focus on and let him work through me to get through these difficult circumstances in my life. May we stop with our worldly pursuits. Can we stop with these worldly pursuits for answers to, to problems that were really only meant for God in our relationship with him to go through together? Let's finally trust him in the way that the scriptures tell us we should trust him. With all thine heart and in all thy ways acknowledge him. Trusting in the Lord. How is your trust with God today? Do you trust him for everything? Like literally everything, right? Not just for the stuff, you know, that you want him to have trust in, right? But for the other parts that we all struggle with in our lives. Can we put those before the Lord and cast those cares upon him because we trust him? My prayer is that we do. That if we're not doing that now, my prayer is that we reflect once again in our lives and see if we can put those things before God, if we can cast those cares upon him. So that's our number one, trusting in the Lord. 
Number two, we need to commune. Commune with the Lord. Goes right along with trusting, right? We need to commune with the Lord. You know, if you're restless at night because of the current political situation, if you're restless at night because you, you really want to know what the, uh, the Dow Jones Industrial is going to do, whether it's going to be 400 points down or 400 points up, depending on what day of the week it is, I mean, we don't know what's happening, right? If you're up at night or you're restless at night for all of these different things, your financial situation, the COVID situation, the election situation, all of these different things, then I can safely say that your prayer life and my prayer life is probably not where it needs to be. Okay. You see, when our prayer life is lacking, the first thing that happens is that we worry. Right? We worry. When our prayer life is lacking, we'll complain. And when our prayer life is lacking, it's going to be with a spirit that is very sour, a sour spirit, grumpy, right? And you know what? I, I get why it's hard. I do. Um, I understand why it's hard to have a, a powerful, fervent prayer life, right, that we all aspire to have, and if we don't, we should. But we're aspiring for this prayer life, and, and it sounds good, and, and, and I want to pray more, and, but I think I understand why it's so hard. And one of the reasons why I think it's so hard is because if you haven't figured out, God can say no. Right? And I don't know about you, but I don't like anyone saying no to me. Right? And the last thing I want is for God to say no to that dream house that I just saw go down $300,000. Right? The last thing I want is for God to say, no, I can't travel the world and play the trumpet in all of these really nice venues. By the way, I really do miss playing the trumpet, <laughs> right? But the nature of the trumpet right now and what it does is probably not the best thing for me to do it, but I really do miss it. So if God can say no to those requests, what makes us think that God is not going to say no to these other requests that we may have? So what do we do? Well, we ignore it, right? We don't bring those things to God. We don't pray about those things. We'll pray about these things over here on this side. But we may not pray about these other ones. We may not even bring up those requests. We can even rationalize in our minds that for these requests, we know a little bit more about it than God does. And so we'll be able to take care of these on our own. But if you haven't noticed, this is the season. What we see happening around us is the perfect opportunity for us to grow in our prayer life and speak to God in ways that we've never spoken with him before. Philippians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. When was the last time we we lived that verse. To be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. That literally means everything, by the way. It's not just bits and pieces that we choose. It literally means everything. And God knows everything, right? We're not fooling God by keeping things away from him. He knows. But just as a father knows uh, uh, his son or daughter well, he sometimes waits for them to ask him for what they want. Why do you think a father would do that? Well, it's because he does this to grow in a relationship with them. He wants to see their dependence on him. Just as our father wants to see our dependence on him. It brings honor and glory to God when we can literally say to God, Lord, God, just take all, I give all of this to you. All of it. Sometimes I don't even know what I have, but whatever it is I do have, I give it to you. Right? Whether it's my time, my talents, whatever, I give it all to the Lord. And it is so worth it. Because if you just look at verse 7 of that passage in Philippians 4, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And that's the beauty of bringing these things to God in prayer. 
You know what God does? He gives us peace. And when God gives us peace, we can get through this situation. We can sleep at night knowing that it doesn't matter what CNN says or it doesn't matter what's happening on television. We know and trust that God is in control. How many of us truly believe that God is in control? Well, then why don't our prayer lives reflect it? Right? With Christ, there is peace. Let's take the time to reflect on our prayer lives. Are we truly growing in our relationship with Christ through prayer? Do we really trust that his answers are the best because they align with his perfect will for our lives? There's a story of a, of a British soldier back in World War I. And in World War I, uh, this, this group of soldiers uh, was in the forest, and uh, this soldier uh, snuck out in the middle of the night into the forest, came back about an hour later. This commanding officer caught him. He grabs him and he says, son, I saw you. You went out about an hour ago. You came back. You didn't tell anybody. Nobody knows what you're doing. So I believe you're conspiring with the enemy. And if you don't prove otherwise, I'm going to shoot you right here, right now for treason. The soldier was terrified. Sir, that's not what it was at all. Sir, that's not what I was doing. I went out there to pray. I went out there to pray for my fellow soldiers. I went out there to pray for my commanding officers. I went out there to pray for my nation. And I just got back. And so the commanding officer looking at him suspiciously says, well, you know what? Prove it. Get down on your knees right now and pray. And so the commanding officer says those things. And of course, the soldier, terrified, gets, gets on his knees. And what could only come from the Holy Spirit, he starts speaking these words and a prayer that could only have come from God and his leading. He's praying for his fellow soldiers. He's praying for his commanding officers. And he's praying for victory in this war. After the prayer is over, the commanding officer looks at him and he says, son, I believe you. This is what he said. If you hadn't drilled often, you couldn't have done so well at the review. And that's exactly what God is asking for us to do in our relationship with him through prayer. It's a relationship. It comes with practice. God wants to know what's in our hearts and in our minds, and he wants us to bring it to him. Of course he knows what it is. He's God. But it's not about that. It's about the relationship that you and I have with him. It's personal. That's how we grow. Remember, he is faithful. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. We need to commune with the Lord. Number three. I told you these were very simple. You can probably just remember these off the top of your head. Number three. We need to grow. Grow in the Lord. I am absolutely convinced that the Lord through this disruption in our lives, has created all of the conditions necessary for you and I to grow spiritually. Remember all of those times where you said you couldn't do things because there was just so much work to do? I am so thankful that I don't have to drive 82 miles every day anymore. Of course, my wife is not happy because she continues to drive, and the plan was for us to drive together. So now she's driving by herself. Sorry, Vanessa. And so... Here we are in this situation where God has created all of these conditions necessary for us to refocus, recalibrate, re-whatever you want to call it. In this case, we reignite or ignite too. Such that we can grow and just experience God in a way that we've never experienced before without any type of disruptions. I'm absolutely convinced that God has created these conditions. Individuals and families can now grow spiritually, right? And he's done this on purpose. Of course, everything the Lord does is on purpose. But first, we have to admit a few things. We have to admit, first and foremost, as we've been hearing now for the past few weeks about this war that we're in, these battles that we're facing, we have to admit that we are in a battle, we are in a war, and that there will be casualties, You see, for, 
there are believers, believe it or not, that are struggling with the influences of the world. Okay? I hate to admit it, but they're there. They are struggling with the world. They are struggling with its influence. And some may never return. But this season has also given folks the perfect ability for us to be able to rededicate ourselves to the Lord. Now remember, we have folks that may not come back. And this season has also given folks the ability or the perfect reason to become lethargic, right? To become lethargic. Think about it. We can wake up on a Sunday and with a few taps on our tablets or our phones or whatever, we can literally join a church service, which is only about an hour or so, right? And then we can just disconnect from it. We, have, we don't even have to leave the bed. We can disconnect from it without feeling any remorse or any guilt about not being there, right? Um, after all, you saw the service, you know, your spiritual quotas filled up, you were able to check a checkbox, you know, fill out a form, whatever it is, whatever you want to call it, right? You were there. But to make it even more convenient for you, the service itself is recorded such that you don't even have to watch it live if you don't want to. Now you can fit it into your own schedule anytime you see fit, at your convenience. When this type of church becomes the norm in your life, your spiritual life will, over time, suffer. It will. Now, God bless technology. I am not saying, and I am definitely not speaking about those that can't be here for obvious reasons. That is not who I'm speaking to. I am speaking to those folks that actually choose to do that. And when that happens, your spiritual life will suffer. If we believe God is in control, then we must believe that the time that we have been given in this situation, through this disruption, is time worth redeeming. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 and 16. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. 2 Timothy chapter 2, 15. What should we be doing? Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We need to remain focused on God. Take that extra time and dive deeper into his word. It is not about just seeing what my app tells me to read today. We're past that. We should be past that. It's, it's about not treating your Christian life as a series of checkboxes to fill out, but to love his word, to read it, to study it, to, to memorize it, to, to just use what you have on a day-to-day -day basis and grow that much more with the Lord. Give ourselves over to God's word. Give ourselves over to him. Imagine looking back at all of this extra time that God has given to us and then saying, you know what? Didn't take advantage. I didn't take advantage of that extra time. I didn't take advantage of that extra time to grow in my spiritual life. Or something like, you know, I could have helped my own family to be more like Christ. But, but I didn't. Other things were more important. The story goes that a man had just been saved, and he was so excited that he wanted to do so many different things for God. So he took a piece of paper and a pen, and he started writing down all these different things that he wanted to do for God. He had a huge list. It filled up the entire sheet. And he took this paper, and he put it on the altar at his church. But at that time, it didn't really give him peace. He didn't really feel any peace by doing that. He didn't understand why. It was a long list. There was a bunch of stuff there. So he goes over to his pastor, and he tells the pastor what, you know, what he did. And the pastor said this. Sir, I want you to take a sheet of paper. I want you to take that pen. And I want you to write your name on it. And I want you to put that on the altar. So the man did just that. And the Spirit of the Lord worked in his life and worked in his heart such that he knew what he needed to do to honor and glorify God.
John chapter 9, verse 4. I must work the works of him that sent me. While it is day, the night cometh, when no man can work. It's only a matter of time before we say to ourselves, you know, I can't. I can't do it anymore for whatever reasons. And we're going to look back at all those times where we had the opportunity to do something for God, and we said no. And we said, no, there's something more important right now. Or, well, you know, there's this other thing. All of these different things that we have in our lives, we'll have to account for one day before God. Most of you know that I love airplanes. And the airplane has a unique trait um, that no other form of transportation has. Uh, not the horse, not the carriage, not the speedboat or the battleship or the helicopter or any other mode of transportation for that matter. All of those other modes of transportation can stop. All of those other modes of transportation could even reverse. But the airplane cannot do either. If a plane were to stand still, well, obviously it would lose its momentum, it would stall out and crash. The plane was meant to fly forward. It was meant to fly forward while handling its upward and downward directions, but always, at all times, moving forward. Sounds an awful lot like the Christian. The safest direction for us is to go forward, but not just forward in any direction, forward towards God. As we get closer to him, we will see not only our lives change, but we can be a light to our communities, we can be a light to our families, and we will be able to be the blessing that God would want us to be. We move forward to be conformed into the image of his son. If we find ourselves stalled, or if we find ourselves moving backwards, we need to get that settled with the Lord right away. 2 Peter 3.18, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. One more thing I wanted to mention about this is, you know, as we grow, we have the opportunity and the privilege uh, to be a blessing to other people. Just as the Lord is faithful to us, we have the privilege of being uh, uh, be, being able to bring care, being able to, to bring comfort and encouragement to others, not just in our church, but with our families, our friends, and even in our community as well. And if you haven't figured out, there are a lot of people hurting in this day and age. There are a lot of people hurting just here. You probably know people that are hurting right now. I mean, just open up your Facebook. It's all about people hurting, right? Anything, a simple call, a text, going to visit, whatever we can do to make a difference in their lives is something that we should consider. It's something that we should be proactive about. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all of our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. You see, just as the Lord is faithful, we need to strive to be faithful to him. And we do that by growing in the Lord. So we've already seen three different things. The first one, we need to trust in the Lord. The second, we need to commune with the Lord. The third that we just saw, we need to grow. We need to grow in our spiritual lives. We need to grow to be used by God. But number four, perhaps the most important, is we need to prepare. We need to prepare for the Lord. This season that we find ourselves in, what we have experienced all around us lasted most of 2020, but it won't last forever. Just like the farmer plants now to be able to reap the harvest later, the same thing is true for us when it comes to the fact that we need to prepare for the harvest. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. That's why this analogy of, of planting and, and harvesting works really well, because that's exactly the way we see our Christian lives today. So what kinds of things do we plant? What is it that we're supposed to be planting? 
well, why don't we plant seeds of faithfulness, right? Why don't we plant seeds of faithfulness, not just to, to the ministry that we have here, but to God himself. Let's be faithful to him and know and understand that we need to be faithful to God in everything, right? Whether it's our prayer life, whether it's in reading our, our, our Bibles, just growing spiritually, we need to be faithful. But what else do we sow? How about seeds of obedience? Why don't we sow seeds of obedience, not just to our elders and to our leaders and to our pastor, but seeds of obedience to God, first and foremost, above everything else. When God tells us to make a right turn and we make a left turn, that's not his fault, that's ours. We are choosing to be disobedient in those situations. Let's plant those seeds of obedience. What else? How about seeds of encouragement? Seeds of encouragement. Titus chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. That sounds like work. Seeds of encouragement is work, but it's work that God prepares us for. It's work that is so worth it. Psalms chapter 96, verses 1 through 3. Of course, the most important seed that we can plant is the seed of the gospel. Psalms 96, 1 through 3. Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord, bless his name. Show forth his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among all people. Prepare for the Lord. How's your preparation going? Right? What have you done? What have I done to prepare for the Lord? Are we taking those preparations seriously? And if not, why not? What's hindering us from preparing for the Lord? Four very simple things to help us know and understand that faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. What have we seen? Four simple things I hope we can remember. Trust in the Lord, commune with the Lord, grow, and of course, to prepare for the Lord. Let's not lose sight of how great and faithful the Lord is even during these times. You know, we may see difficult and extreme situations come to fruition. We may see these things. But just remember, seeing the faithfulness of God in our lives is a privilege Seeing the faithfulness of God in our lives is a blessing. But just by working in these four different areas of our Christian walk, we can experience God's faithfulness in ways that we've never seen before. And during these times, God can prepare us, God can mold us, and God can use us in great and mighty ways. Four very simple things. I just want to finish off with one thought here. Has anyone here ever heard of a man named Horatio Spafford? After I finish with this story, you probably all will know who he is. Horatio Spafford and his wife Anna lived in the, uh, the late 1800s. And uh, they were blessed with five children, uh, one boy and four girls. A uh, tragedy suddenly uh, struck their only boy, who was four years old. He died of scarlet fever. But the family remained faithful to God because they knew and understood how the Lord had been faithful to them. A few years after that, it's 1871, and if you don't know your history, there was a great fire in Chicago, a huge fire in Chicago. It destroyed many businesses. Over 100,000 people became homeless during these fires in Chicago. The Spafford family were fairly wealthy, but they lost everything. So now we have a family that lost their boy, lost their businesses. But even during and after that fire, they tended to the poor, used whatever wealth they had to buy food and supplies for all of those people suffering during that time. You see, they remained faithful because they knew and understood how the Lord had been faithful to them. Two years later, Spafford decided to take his family on a trip to London. Uh, he had uh, asked his wife and, and four daughters to go ahead. Um, he had some business that he wanted to finish off in Chicago, and so the family set sail for London. 
during that trip, that ship hit another ship. And it only took 12 minutes for the ship to sink. And Spafford lost his four daughters. His wife was found floating on a plank. She was taken to London, and she sent a telegraph back to her husband. And the telegraph, all it said was, Saved, I'm alone. Spafford immediately, uh, upon receiving that telegram, he set sail to be reunited with his wife. On one particular day in the middle of the ocean, he gets a knock on his door. The captain requests to see him. So he goes up to see the captain. And the captain's looking at his charts, and he's looking at his maps. And he's looking back and forth, and he says, Sir, to the best of my ability, I believe this is where the ship sank. If you look out to the left side of the ship, you'll be able to get an idea of where your daughters were when they died. A few minutes later, he goes to his cabin, and he writes these words. It is well with my soul, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot that house taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. How could a man like Spafford have that kind of peace knowing that he had lost his son, knowing that he had lost his businesses, knowing that he had lost four daughters and almost lost his wife, how could a man like that have peace? That peace can only come from God because faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. 